going to be really difficult for me to sit still and present, but we are thrilled to be here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the women that are with me here. I taught high school English for 13 years. My husband is a wel owns a welding fabrication shop. My father was a contractor, so NCCR is an absolute passion for me because it doesn't get better than construction and education together. And we just want to talk a little bit about what we've experienced and hopefully give you all some ideas of where we think we need to go with our recruiting and our retaining talent. I have Carol Bionda with me right here. She served as the first female national president of the Associated Builders and Contractors, was the first female board of trustee chair for NCCR, the first female member of the Beavers, and served as national president of the Women Construction Owners and Executives, and she is now retired but spent from 1986 until recently retired, vice president of Nova Group. So we're, we're so glad that you're with us, Carol. We also have Stacy Bell, who is the director of human resources for PPM and MCOR company. She has over <coughs> 25 years of human resource experience with a focus on operations within varying industrial markets, supporting capital maintenance and grassroots projects as a contractor. She is also the current chairperson for the Human Resource Construction Council. Thanks for being with us, Stacy. Thank you. And then Tammy Gamble Gurnell. She is the president and CEO of Girly Shop Teacher. She is the brand ambassador and model for Duluth Trading Company for the Real Women That Do Real Work campaign. She taught construction and building trades at Duncansville High School in Duncansville, Texas for five years and now reaches out to students as an ambassador for apprenticeship and the construction industry as a whole. Thanks for joining us, Tammy. So our discussion today, one of the things, if you've heard me speak before, is that we have an issue. We have an issue with construction. We keep trying to change the image. We keep trying to recruit more, and we haven't really found that silver bullet. Nursing did. Nursing's done a fabulous job. We went from a nursing shortage to lines, people waiting to get into colleges, into programs. I can tell you, I have contractors, I go out and talk to them, they said, but ours is hard work and it's dirty work, it's a different job. I said, they are changing bedpans. They're lifting people, they're washing people. How do you tell me that construction is a dirty job? That's not what the issue is. What the issue is, is we don't speak with one voice. We're a little bit fractured. We haven't all started saying the same thing and really talking about the professionals and the wonderful careers in construction. And we have to ask ourselves, are we part of the problem? Do we talk about it? Do we want our kids to go into construction? Do we believe that every, every project out there is a, is a project of choice, that we are an industry of choice? And so that's what we want to talk about here. So before we get started, some of the things we know, we say things, we, we use certain words to describe our industry. What is one word that comes to each of your minds that we need to stop saying in our industry so that we can project a more positive professional industry? I'm gonna start with you, Carol. Okay, um, among us, we hear the word craft or crafts, and, and it's, it's positive, it's certainly not negative, but if you t talk to parents, you talk to guidance counselors, you talk to, to teachers, and, and you say, oh, what about the crafts? They look at you like you're stupid. Why would I send my daughter, and why the hell would I send my, certainly my son or daughter into that industry? And so, I mean, it's a word, and it's, it's not what we mean it to say, but it's how it's interpreted. So I think we've got to be really careful that when we're talking to people, know the audience we're talking to. I talk to you, craft doesn't bother you. Talk to a teacher, it does. So I think we have to be a little more careful in, in how we uh, spread our message. Do you think, Carol, it's the word craft or the word trade? That you I think, think they're both bad. Both bad. Yeah. Example. I mean, because to me, they mean the same. But the trades, yeah. I mean, among construction, certainly engineering, you know what that means. But a lot of people, two nights ago on Jeopardy, one of the questions was, what do you call a guy who, um, you know, one of the trades that um, led cattle and oxen? Teamsters. But I mean, truck drivers are teamsters. People don't even know what a teamster is anymore. That's, that's sad. All right, so Stacy, how about you? What's, what's a word that you would like to see us stop saying? 
Well, um, Jen, you know, I have a love of the craft workforce. I mean, that's, that's where my passion is. I, I would love to say every engineer moves me as much, um, but, you know, the people who build work are, are the people I most admire. And the one uh, terminology that just gets me every time is field hands or the hands, as if the only two things they have are a set of hands. It's just, it's not very personal, and, and um, I, I think it's a term we all need to just cease using. All right, hands. So, Tammy, what about you? My word is shop class. You know, as a building trades instructor, <coughs> um, oftentimes parents and counselors and other administrators within the school will say, oh, just go to shop class. The class that I teach is construction technology which requires the skills in mathematics, physics, and other sciences. So we have to stop minimizing what we're calling our classes in schools and make sure that there's honor there on that particular level. Absolutely, I think, I think words are important and just how we say skilled professionals and uh, technicians, and we need to make sure that we believe it, we say it, so thank you very much. What about, um, Stacy? let's start with you. So construction needs to become an industry of choice, I, I mentioned that, and we know that we're competing with aerospace and nursing and many other industries. What do you think we can specifically do to start attracting people to our industry? Well, the word aerospace sounds really smart, so let's put that to the side. And, and, and the nursing industry, let's all be honest, about 15 or 20 years ago, that industry tanked. We had such a shortage. Um, most uh, hospitals, doctors, physicians, they had to go and recruit uh, foreign workers and bring them in because there was a shortage in the United States until they changed the image. And the image adjusted from, hey, you probably have a little knowledge of medical, but not a ton because you're not a physician, to nursing being a very rewarding career, pays well, um, it can be done virtually, does not have to be in a traditional sense, and many of us even get our medical services from nurse practitioners. So thinking of how we can enhance um, the image of construction, I think we have to stop portraying it as, hey, this work is dirty, it's hard, it's an elements. Um, you have to have little education or, or knowledge, probably um, not that many skills. And we, we have a lot of focus on the physical stamina. What we don't do is we don't change that image to the mental um, skill and the intelligence that a craft professional actually has. Um, the mathematical skills one has to have. A pipe fitter needs to, to know trigonometry. They have to connect um, piping, and that piping has to have a tolerance for pressure inside of it. Electricians, you know, are, are using voltage calculations. Everything I just described was not something physical. It was intelligence and it was skills. And until we, we change all the marketing materials and we take the focus off of, hey, you have to be an ept and lift 50 pounds and work, you know, 12 hour days and we describe it as the skills and intelligence and the creativity and working in teams, then it's always going to be portrayed as like, hey, it's a leftover career. Mm. Do you think, so you talk about describing it and you had mentioned, so where all would we describe it besides marketing materials? I think we talked earlier about even in the just job descriptions. Oh yes, uh, so you know, G Google, you know, uh, craft worker, I hate using that terminology, but, but Google it, you'll get some hits. Um, you know, a lot of the job boards we use, they'll describe it as, uh, you know, a lot of physical work, may need a, a high school diploma, maybe a GED and some type of training, which is crazy. Even the Department of Labor sort of describes it as such. And then you look at the job descriptions when we post the jobs, we don't actually focus on what are the skills or the competencies. We focus on the schedule and how many pounds can you lift and um, you know, the PPE that's required or the background or um, you know, any of the safety requirements. And so our job descriptions aren't even aligning. They're not attractive. It's interesting. Tammy, you, we had our conversations when we were talking about this and you used the example of the banking industry. Can you tell us a little bit about 
what you brought to our attention that we didn't realize about the banking inter industry. Yes, I had the unique opportunity to tour a campus for Capital One. Uh, one of the uh, wonderful sponsors of my class is a top level executive for Capital One. And when touring their campus, they had the opportunities for employees to go out and do other things and learn other practices that they're able to bring back into their banks. Instead of having traditional bank locations, now they have banking cafes. So breaking the stereotype that construction is just a dirty work site and also giving the employees opportunities to bring themselves into the workforce. There's a beautiful young lady who uh, was a, had a passion for yoga. And when the young lady described that she had a, a desire to do yoga, they sent her to training so that she could become a trained yoga instructor and allowed her to have training classes inside of the cafe for banking. That is completely different than what we would normally think of from a banker, but yet she was able to bring her personal life into her work environment and then entice the community into her zone, which was banking. I like that's kind of interesting, thinking about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about you know, doing some changes, industry of choice, what do you think the age, like what age should we start talking to kids about careers in construction, do you think? I think easily three years old is when they can say construction. So let's go with age three. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many of you all have had children in your lives, but they're pretty precocious at age three, and they're ready to try and experiment with any and everything. So I believe that putting tools in the hands of children at a very young age and getting them interested, even with a screwdriver, even with a little hammer, just getting them interested in the career and letting them know what you do is fun and interesting. You know, you can do so many things around your house with construction objects. How many of you all have floors that are laid with 12 by 12 tiles? You know, use those things and start to discuss and talk to them about square footage, about mathematics, about, you know, cubic feet when it comes to how much um, air that you need to pump into a room just to condition it. So there are all types of things that we have easily available. We're all sitting in a room right now, and there's a certain number of lights that are necessary just for us to be lit well. We have to start describing those things and making it known to our children that these buildings that we sit in often outlast ourselves. We leave legacies when we leave buildings. So let's get the legacies in the kids while they're little. Yeah, and talking about legacy made me think of even like Legos and stuff. You know, yes. kids love to build singing castles and with Legos, and then at some point we tell them stop building. So right. and, it's and, kind of crazy. Right. Absolutely. We tell them to stop building, but then we also have opportunities with video games. Minecraft is an excellent example of how you can make building fun. We, if we were able to simply infuse some of the um, construction jobs as well as maybe some construction company names into video games, that would be e an easy way to entice the younger generation to even know that we exist. How many McDonald's signs do we see everywhere? How many signs do we see for you know, different restaurants, different video games, different movies? They're everywhere, but is the construction industry putting those signs up where they're easy to see? We have to have, what do we say, at least 13 impressions of something before we even notice it. So I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but okay. um, you know we have to start putting the imagery out there and so that it's seen for our youth. Well, and I think along that line, uh, Tammy, so when we talk about the kids, the individual kids, and we want to recruit them, and we got to start talking even as young as three years old, which I think is way younger than a lot of us thought that we needed to start talking about it. But what about the schools? You know, we Career days have been around for a while, and we've talked about career days, but what, what are some other things in the schools and stuff that we could actually do to help out? So let me narrow it down to just three little ideas, okay, because I've got more than that. <laughs> um, one of the things that has worked in my classroom setting is that I have career professionals that come and stop by our classroom frequently. Um, when the, I have a, a, a good friend that works for a major construction company, and he stops by the classroom at least once every two to three weeks, just for 30 minutes to pop in and say hello. That way he has an opportunity to infuse himself 
into our zone where the students start to feel comfortable with him and are able to ask him questions. A lot of times the career days, they're great, but when a student only sees you one time, they're a little bit timid to try to get to know you. So the more impressions that you can make by being in the environment is wonderful. An easy opportunity, if any of you all have uh, children in your lives, go to the local high school sporting events. Wear your company logos on your shirts. It entices conversation. You can also have your company maybe sponsor the food for the team after the game or before the game. Um, and then put maybe your banner up. I'm sure many of you all have banners. Raise your hands if you have company banners. <laughs> Ask them to display your company banner uh, on the railing at the football game or at the basketball game or at the soccer game or the baseball game. And that way, that's another way for an impression to be made for your company. Is there something else you think they could do along with that? Because I know a lot of times, you know, you sponsor something. How is that going to translate into a potential hire one day? How do you think by putting your banners up? Putting your banners up allows for the impression to be made that you exist. A lot of times, kids don't even know that construction careers even exist. And so when they see a major construction company banner and they see a crane that's in the air or they're driving by a new build, they're able to put those connections together. And so that's how we can help with that. All right, also, Carol, you had mentioned that, that NOVA sponsored some competitions and things. We, Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? We try to get involved both, certainly at the high school level, at the college and community college level, and the banners are good because you want them to notice you, but, but you've got to, um, Cal Poly has a build uh, a boat, a concrete boat, so we'll sponsor that. Then when you go to the school and you talk to the engineering department, they already know you. Uh, you know, get involved in, in the internship. It's a great program. They have that both, we do that with the, the local uh, high school. Um, we go through our computers, most of us. At two years, you get rid of them. What do you do with them? We gave them to the local high school. That was cool. But then when I called up the superintendent of Napa County Schools and said, we, we got to work together, at least he knew me. And so you've got to get, and you can all get involved with your local schools because they're resource poor, we've got resource. You can get an incredible bang for your buck with not a lot of bucks. And, and I don't think some of that's realized. And when you go to career day, don't, don't take your HR people, maybe as a backup, don't take your lawyers, don't take your vice president, take your craft people. If you're going to a high school, try to get somebody who was a graduate of that high school. They're young, they can talk to them, they're gonna believe what they say a hell of a lot more than they're gonna believe that we say. Bring your engineers, you know, we, for Cal Poly and, and for Berkeley, we will bring females because I want to recruit and, and so you want the people of color and it's easier to talk the talk if, if I'm not talking but they are. And again, there's, you've just so, I mean, you've, uh, again, you can, you can adopt schools, you can adopt their programs, you can help them so they know you and then, you know, bring them out to your job sites if you can. Bring them, you know, your fab shops or something where they can see what you do. And what we do is really exciting. And we're selling a job, and we shouldn't be. We should be selling the buildings across the street. We should be selling our wastewater. I mean, where else in the world? You turn on a tap, you're going to get water, you're going to get hot water, and you're not going to die from drinking it. I mean, what we do is incredible, and, and I don't think we sell what we do as an industry, and, and I think that's a disservice to our people. Well, and you know, you mentioned something in a conversation too before about not only getting the kids and interacting there, but even with the teachers that what, you were doing. One of the problems we have is, again, the guidance counselor, I don't want to send your kid, I, I want to send them to community college. So in the summer, when the science teachers and the math teachers don't have a job, and we had local jobs, we would bring them in like as a, as a project engineer. A, they loved it, they made money, and, and they saw, this is something you can do. This is something I can send the kids to that their parents aren't going to get mad, that I'm going to feel good about. And we just, we, we just have to sell ourselves a little better. Yeah, I like that involved. I, I like getting the teachers involved, especially, you know, in the summertime because 
being a teacher, and Tammy, you can agree with that, you know, money gets a little scarce sometimes when you're teaching. And so the summertime, I've heard quite a few contractors lately talking about hiring not only teachers in the summertime so that they get a better idea of construction, but even some counselors that they've hired and stuff, and even some at-risk in the high school programs, you have counselors that deal with at-risk kids, and they were utilizing them to help new people coming in to, uh, with the contractor for them to get used to it and find out you know, what makes them tick and how they can get them to stay. Uh, Stacy, we talked a little bit about career days, and you said some really interesting things about what a career day is and what it can be. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Um, coming from the contractor side, partnering with um, education organizations is <laughs> awesome. But you really need to think outside the box of other career day sources. So, you know, you have a uh, untapped potential of folks. So you could um, have career days with uh, folks that are exiting the military. Um, many people may or may not know that there's a CB organizations, the builders of, of the Navy, of the construction uh, uh, in the military equation. You can partner, you can go to their bases, you can um, describe the opportunities and have a career day where they make the transition from military to you know, uh, the, the workforce. You've got the Department of Corrections. I know I say this, people always say, what are you talking about, Bell? And I say, look, there are, are a lot of people, unfortunately incarcerated, that are being taught um, career and technical education within the system, they're being rehabilitated and then we're not tapping into that resource. And yes, I've heard every owner and every other contractor give me the list of obstacles, we're gonna talk about that later, the list of obstacles of everything you can't do. I am in HR, I try to approach things of, every rule can be bent most of the time <laughs> to what you can do. So, you know, if you have a partnership, if you have a client that you could convince, hey, listen, there's a workforce that we could tap into through the Department of Corrections. They're trained, they're rehabilitated. Um, you have a background on them, you know where they came from. <laughs> um, you know, why not use that resource? You also have voc rehab programs, you have women's shelters, you have religious organizations. Career days do not have to be at a high school or a technical school or a college. They can be anything within your community. We just don't tap into it. And then when we do, now I'm gonna get on my HR you know, horse right now, how many times do we actually make a hire from those career days? And I challenge everybody in this room, you know, get with your HR partners, your recruiting partners, your operational partners. How many times do you have a career day and you hire none? You hired none because you weren't willing to take a chance of someone you didn't know and they weren't referred to you. You don't know what their training was and it's an entry level position and you're not utilizing the career day that you just, you know, spent a day at or a half a day at. And, and that's why that image is so important of getting changed. Of It is a career choice. It is a proud career choice. So approach your career days in, in a, you know, a non-traditional manner. And I, I like the idea of a career day is wherever you want it to be with that whichever group. And I've heard a lot about people getting involved with um, religious organizations in their communities and stuff. So oh, I, I really I'm, like that. There's Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H. Um, I would... 4-H, I was Girl Scouts, we've talked about that. I mean, those, those are great compliments to the construction career. There's FFA, FHA, I mean, you know, you have a pool of folks who've said, hey, listen, this is what I enjoy to doing as a career. Um, you know, why not continue to court them and make that career happen? Absolutely. If, if I could add to that, um, especially when you have jobs in inner cities, um, you really get the community involved and certainly the churches will, will really help you, but, but you're absolutely right. You do that twice and you hire no one, don't even bother doing it a third time. I mean, and, and are they going to be fully trained? Probably not, but we all need entry level people too. And, and this is, you know, and you might have affirmative uh, action obligation. So, I mean, you can get a lot with the community involved. Your point's well taken. Thank you. Tammy, another interesting thing you talked about, and we missed it here for a minute, is signing days. Yes. yes. So do you want to talk a little oh, bit about yes. that? 
Okay. Um, one of the most uh, garnered events during my middle son's high school career was college signing day for um, football. A few weeks after he had his signing day, I had the pleasure of going to a college signing day for an all-girls school. And to see the young ladies so excited and so happy to sign to go to college, we're missing an opportunity to have signing days for people going into the building trades and the construction industry. If we're doing the recruitment like we should, if we're doing the apprenticeship programs, if we're doing the internships, we should be able to have signing days that are just as exciting and festive and fun-filled with all of our students, especially coming off of the high school level. We should have celebrations for those that are new entries into our craft, into our profession. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so having those celebrations, who doesn't like to be celebrated? If you don't like to be celebrated, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm, you know, unless you're from a particular um, environment, I think everybody likes to get at least one candle on a cake at least once a year. It's just what we like to do. Celebrations are great, they're fun, they're festive. And when you celebrate one person, you, you give something back to your community and you give someone an opportunity to look forward to something. So let's celebrate our, our students and let's celebrate those that are coming into our profession. I've seen some really cool uh, signing days too when the contractors come to the schools and they bring the hats and they bring the shirts and the kids are lined up at a table and the contractors go behind them and they're handing them, you know, welcoming them to, you know, PPM or wherever it is that they might be going. So I, I, I love the idea and I've seen some really great press around that that's recently coming up. So I'm glad that you had reminded me about signing days because I think it's a very cool thing to do. So, you know, if we get people interested and we're bringing them in, Stacy, one of the things that we've talked about through the years looking at HR, so 25 years you've been uh, in HR roles in the industry, what do you think are some innovative hiring practices in that process of it that we could, that we could do? Well, um, I could spend the next nine hours talking <laughs> about hiring practices. Um, it's, it's, it's probably where I've you don't spent... Have, you don't have nine hours. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in this. Uh, look, you have to hire folks, right? You have to do it. There's some legal requirements. You've got your company policies. You've got your client policies. You've got a ton of forms that have to be filled out. You are hiring three generations right now. We have baby boomers, we have um, Gen X, and then we have millennials. Um, baby boomers, they like paperwork. Um, Gen X, we like computers. We like computers with keyboards, um, and then the millennials like tablets. So you need to really take a look at your hiring practices and see how you cater to all three generations. A couple things, um, you know, so what if someone wants to do a paperwork packet? Not the worst thing in the world, I mean, it's manual, but if it makes the person happy and they can get it done quickly, give them a packet of paper. Maybe you don't have connectivity to do it online. Um, think about those entering the workforce. I spent a lot of time doing studies on um, how long, actually timing each hiring action, each form that has to be filled out. What I discovered with our new millennials, people are entering the workforce, they don't use keyboards because they don't use computers. They use mobile devices. So then having an HR kiosk and asking them to fill out this paperwork with the shift key and the control key, things were locked up with the uppercase and the lowercase and one you know, character and a letter and can't be your first name and last name password requirements. You know, Try to make your paperwork mobile enabled. Um, better yet, you know, you know you've got the, the customer, they want their people in production quick. They want their safety training done, they want the site training done, and hey contractor, you better figure out how to do it all in about 60 minutes because the, the clock is ticking. So, you know, try to integrate your HR system any way that you can. If you are going through the candidate process, you have a first name, you have a last name. By now, I hope you have a social security number that's been shared with the recruiter. You have address, you have all those items. Why not populate 
your hiring forms over a mobile device and invite your folks to complete it. They could do it in advance, in advance voluntarily if you like. Um, they could do it at the job site. Um, what's the worst thing in the world if all your paperwork is electronic and you didn't have to have a paper file room or someone who scans it in? I know there's a lot of people out here that are still using the scan method um, and you're automating. But you gotta make the hiring processes work for generations that, that are not our generations in most cases, but the, the people who are entering the workforce. Um, I'm telling you, it, you know, I could go on and on. I would also suggest, you know, I, I have sent secret shoppers in to actually go through the application process. I have asked executives, hey, one of our um, leadership meetings, um, I had everybody get out their mobile phone and apply for a pipe fitter job. Actually fill it out. They went through the steps. I needed them to know how easy it was or how hard it was. Look at the job description. Did it say what you um, wanted it to say? Is that your brand? Um, I've had executives say, I applied for this job and it was a terrible experience. It took me 35 minutes. I'm like, yes, go out and apply for the job. And then, and then have a secret person, candidate, hired in and have them go through the hiring process. See um, what you're telling your workforce, your precious commodity. Are you, are you saying, hey, welcome to the company? Are you making it easy? Or are you just tell them, yeah, 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 we'll get started in this trailer. We don't have any coffee or water and the, you know, port johns are outside and everybody's like at the side of the trailer on their phone trying to find the other job. That's what really happens. So get to know your practices, get intimate, inspect them, go through the process and remove the obstacles that are in place and you all have them, I still have them, and make improvements, and I'm telling you, you're hiring, it'll go much more smoothly than what you've probably experienced so far. You talk about removing obstacles, and you gave us an example earlier when we were talking about um, a group that removes those obstacles. Can you tell, can you share yes. with the audience about that? You know, I am a proud uh, mother of uh, a combat engineer in the, in the, in the U.S. Um, Army National Guard who's also a police officer in the, the city of Seattle. And the one thing I think is so phenomenal is how the military does such a great job at removing the obstacles to get people to join. Their campaigns, if you look at their campaigns, they're lucrative, they're attractive. You know, they're, they're not, I mean, they're, you're, you're um, you know, you're protecting your country, you're learning a skill. People don't come out of high school as a trained um, combat engineer or uh, a sniper or an infantryman um, or woman. So the military does a great job attracting people in, removing all the obstacles. Hey, we'll bring you in, you don't have to worry about anything, we'll go through this process, we'll interview you, you get selected, hey, day one, we put you in training, um, you don't have any gear, no worries. Here's a list of the things that you do need. Military does a very good job of outlining what you do need, what the expectations are, and then removing those obstacles so that, you know, hey, this is great. I didn't know what I didn't know because you know, no one, uh, most people are not trained in the military before they join the military. They're probably a son or a daughter um, of a service person, but you know, the military does a phenomenal job of removing the obstacles. That's the space we need to get into. We have to think about what are the obstacles. Mm -hmm. If you have a workforce like um, that you're catering to to attract out the Department of Corrections, they're not gonna come out of the Department of Corrections with um, steel toe boots. So come up with a program. I mean, my gosh, give them a pair of boots. Um, you know, give them a pay advance to, to get the boots and repay through payroll. Remove the obstacles. Because if you don't, and you keep creating, you know, all the why nots and the obstacles, the continued skill shortage is just, it's gonna get worse. And all of us will have overrun projects, schedules, um, you know, and, and ultimately our consumers are the ones, and it's everyone here in this room that's affected. You know, it's really interesting that you say that the military doesn't expect the people to already be trained. They go out and they get people and they train them, and they're the best trained people that we have in the United States is our military. Yep. Yeah. And yet we, as a construction industry, feel like, well, we can't hire you because you don't have any training. Right. Uh, oh, my gosh. It, it, yes. It just I mean, seems like such a... Well, uh, oh. 
such great leadership skills, working with teams and problem solving and following directions and you know, counting on each other, knowing what critical role you play and what I play in the military to be successful. And, and putting the project first, you know, the mission is important. And you know, think back though, back to the Vietnam War, you couldn't get enough people drafting them. Now there are so many people volunteering, and that is an image thing. I mean, you see them rappelling out of a helicopter, that's sexy. Kids want to do that. <laughs> We've got to make our industry uh, more palatable, and it is. We're just, I, I think we're doing a poor job of selling it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about, you know, Carol, so we talk about, you know, selling our interest industry and recruiting them in, but what about the retention of it? What do we need to do a better job of retaining people in our industry? As we all know, once you've got them in, it's easier to keep somebody, it should be easier to keep someone you have than recruiting new. And certainly when you were talking about the different generational, um, Back in the old days, you know, you kept your job, that meant you were good, doing a good, good job. I think with the millennials, they need a little more, you're doing a good job. Um, it's amazing that one of the questions I would ask, what do you want to be doing in five years? What do you want to be doing in 10 years? These millennials will tell you. Yeah. And, then, and then you have to ask them though, what can I do to make that happen? Because they're, they truly are looking more for a career. If I do A, B, and C, I want to get to here. So we have to provide them, and, and it's easy to say, okay, here's the career path. And that's great the day you hire, but you've got to really keep going with that. And you also have to almost mentor them and have somebody checking in with them because they won't necessarily tell you things aren't working out, they'll just walk. And we, we can't have them dragging up, it's too hard to get people. So I think we really have to have a plan for them. We have to make sure that we're following what we said we'd do for you, that if you do do this, if you're training, you're gonna be eligible to go up. And, and I think we have to be flexible because for us, we'll, we'll get young engineers, keep them in the office for maybe six months. Once they go out in the field, they don't want to ever come back. And so we have to change that. And, and I mean, it's, we can do it. And, and I think retention is the key. Right. Stacy, you talk a lot about career progression and career ladders. I know you like to use that a lot. I, I do. Um, you know, one of the areas of opportunity in HR that I've always seen is we, we don't do a good job with our operation partners of making a visual um, at the point of recruitment that says, you know, here's the possibilities of all the career paths that you can go through. And as you're progressing, these are not promises, but here's the opportunities, here's the skills and the competencies you have to master, right? Um, and, and we give that to them because I'll tell you what, you, you go out, you do research, you ask millennials, what makes, um, you know, what, what is attractive to them when selecting an employer, employer, and they'll tell you, it's important to me that I know what I need to do to be successful and progress. Most of us in this room, or some of us, we, we probably went through the career progression where, trust me, I'll take care of you, you gotta put your time in. Um, I, I think I even shared one of my first large you know, promotions, I volunteered and said, just give me the job, don't even pay me more money, right? Because I was so desperate to show my skill set. So of course, I mean, the employer wasn't that crazy. They gave me the job and no more money. And I was fine with that. But I'm of a different generation. And so your millennials, they're not fine with that. They want to know what it is they need to do. And I challenge most everyone in this crowd, do you have a visual? Do you have that career ladder? And are you sharing that um, with your recruits, with your new hires? Are you asking them? I think it's absolutely important for them to, you know, I think when we started talking about the millennials at first, we were all like, well, they wanna be VP tomorrow. Sure. But what they want, what we've found out in the more that I've worked with, the more that I've talked, is they just want to know, what am I supposed to do? Like, obviously, when Carol asks the question and says, what do you want to do five or 10 years? It may be, I want to be president of this company. Surprisingly, that isn't what they say. Okay. It's usually, I want to be a senior project manager. You know, I, I want to be a superintendent. I want to be the project superintendent. And it's, 
it, it, they're all doable. I mean, I, I was expecting, oh, I want to be president. Ain't going to happen. Right. But, but see your project manager can. Could happen, but, yeah. but they need to see it, and they want to know what do they have to do. So I think that's vitally important. Tammy, you talked about some things about retention and things that we could offer that were really a different way of thinking. Yes. Uh, one of the things we need to do is have, make that work-life balance a lot more even. Uh, one of the campuses that I visited has a scratch kitchen available on campus, and the employees are able to go on their computers and program in what they want to take home for dinner to their families. Now that sounds real easy, but if you think about the inconvenience that your employees go through at the end of the day when they're going home to pick up their family members, and they may have to run this way or that way, and they're running through drive throughs and they're not feeding their families or themselves very healthy because they're running through drive throughs is it a big obstacle to maybe make a scratch kitchen or even have a catering service bring in dinners? Now, the employee is paying for that, but what a convenience that you're able to offer to them to even partner up with a catering company to say, these are the dinners that are offered on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and help offset some of that running around time for your employees, just simply going to the grocery store and trying to get home and cook for their families. Give them some healthy options so that they can be uh, more productive when they are able to come to work the next day. A person that eats well produces better, and that's just like a person that exercises is better for your health insurance as well. You know, it, it's so crazy. It seems like it is a simple thing, but it makes sense, right? And I know that one time, Stacy, we were talking and you said, we always have to remember we're not just hiring the craft professional, we're hiring their family. Like, it's very important for us to remember that because we do have projects that they're working 10 hour days sometimes and they're doing things. So knowing that they have an option like that, I, you know, it's just, I think it's a creative way of thinking. I, I agree, I mean, retention tactics, do not have to always equate to pay and increase costs for everyone in this room. A simple thank you, you'd be surprised. Mm. Um, you know, I, I mentioned as a retention um, tactic that after an employee had received so many years of service with all their stops and ads, um, either, you know, from project to project, that we would actually send a letter to the home, to the family, and thank them for, hey, supporting us and recognizing for the, the, the service of the employee and, then, and, and what that means to their family member. Um, you know, it costs, it costs postage. It costs postage and, and printing. And, um, you know, when, when your workforce is making a choice, sometimes it's not all about pay. It's sometimes it's about opportunity. It's about how they feel about their employer. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about mentoring. It's a ton about good leadership. And, and having leaders within your organization that are describing, you know, hey, my career ladder when I started was X, but yours, you have so much more opportunity, is a Y. I mean, th those are small retention tactics that you can use. Acknowledgement alone. Thank you. I mean, just, it's, it's amazing what that can buy you, and, and we forget to do that. Oh it's so easy, and it's, it costs nothing. Right. I, I told Carol, you know, I, I try to get to know all the craft workforce. Again, I'm not giving the, um, I'm not trying to ignore the engineers in this room, but my passion is the, the, um, the craft professional. And so if I've had the opportunity to know their families, their children's or spouse's name, when I walk a job, I go and ask. I don't keep them away from productivity, so I'm not, you know, belaboring them for hours on end. But I thank, I thank them. I, I say something related back to their family or ask a question. And boy, if you could just see the smiles on their faces, you know, whether it's me or another leader of the organization, you know what? I, I see them go back to work, and they kind of like, you know, tap their coworker, like, "Yeah, man, did you hear that?" <laughs> and you know, that satisfaction and retention didn't cost anything. Absolutely, and I know that you even shared with us uh, different organizations you've worked for even uh, do recognition through apps and stuff and people that hit milestones with training. And so I, all of those kind of things, it's, it's the recognition, it's the acknowledgement. But, but it's also, you know, sh celebrating mm -hmm. um, a birthday. You've been with us 10 years, 15. That's, that's important. Yeah. Or your, your, your daughter graduates from school or something, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely, those are good. So as we wrap up here, um, we just talked about action steps that we felt like maybe that we could share, that each of you would maybe say something that you think this group, so when you leave here, when you go back, what is something, Carol, that you would like to share and say that's, that's something viable that the organizations could start enacting, even if not completing in the next month or two months or whatever it might be? I, I would really encourage you to, to pick three people, um, all of them under 30, um, somebody in the craft professionals, someone in the engineering, and someone in the project management, because I think, um, and, and groom them and train them and monitor them so they can sell your message, whether you're going to the school, whether you're at a baseball game, but, but you need ambassador or whatever, you want a cheerleader. And the, the people who are already doing it, the young people who are doing it, are so much more effective and, and uh, and it costs you nothing, and you're gonna be recruiting people anyway. So if anything else, just go back to your offices and do something. Might not be right, then do something else, but we can't sit on our hands and do nothing when the Amazons of the world are offering, you know, all these really, not necessarily expensive, but these fun things. And it, we've just gotta make it easier and more fun. Absolutely. I love the, the young people, choosing young people under 30. We talk about that all the time. Stacy, what about you? Um, you know, I would I encourage everyone to take a look at uh, an app, you know, having a company app focused at your um, craft professional workforce. Um, you know, the, people love apps. And you're, you are, uh, you can use an app that describes success of the project. Um, you can highlight employees. It's also very attractive to people who are not employees, potential customers and clients. Um, you can also um, share, used to be a company net newsletter, right? So I'm saying move that to an app, um, tie that into your career um, site, uh, allow your employees or even potential candidates, allow them to highlight, you know, why, what would be the worst thing if they submitted something that they did great and you push that out to your app and your, um, you know, your potentials and your current people, they see this, they, they get empowered. Um, everybody just, it's, I can't emphasize enough the use of technology in thinking like the 20 year old. And that's hard for all of us, right? But wouldn't it be neat if you pull out your app and you say, oh yeah, I worked for this company, maybe they don't work for you anymore. And I built this and I worked with this person and here's all the great things I did. Oh gosh, I, they just got this awarded. Shoot, I'm off of a job right now. Maybe I can get back on with them. I mean, implement an app. Mm -hmm. And I think companies that, that help their employees feel connected see better retention because people they don't know connected. what they don't know that's going on with their company. They like that. They like that. And what about you, Tammy? I think it's important that we also use technology. Hashtags. I remember when I first heard, build your hashtag. The little number sign that we're accustomed to calling on our phones. Hashtag constructions fun. Hashtag whatever your company name is out in the community. Put hashtags, have your employees and encourage your employees in their personal lives to demonstrate the things that they do so that they're out and they're social. It costs nothing for your employee to say something great about your company on their personal social media page. Encourage that. Let other companies know that this is the greatest place to work by putting a hashtag. And that's something simple, it's absolutely free, hashtag. Girly shop teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Grassroots all the way, right? That's what it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're wrapping up. We're at the very end here. I will say that, you know, a lot of times we don't know what to say when we do these visits to schools and everything. One of the things that uh, NCCR prides itself on is its Build Your Future initiative. And we have even PowerPoints for young people to go in schools if you're a contractor wanting to talk to them or we have our BYF Today program that we've started with parents and teachers and counselors and doing things, so lots of resources there. The ladies, hopefully you're gonna join us in the Innovative Showcase and we'll be in there at the NCCR booth, so if there's questions, but hopefully there's something that each of you can take away. I think 
being creative right now and coming up with new things, the best thing you could probably do is go and find the youngest people at your company and ask them what they think you should be doing. Is we can come up all day long with things, but really that's where we need to be. Uh, we're, all sh we're all suffering from the shortage, and so we have to be proactive and do that. So thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and come by and see us at the booth. All right, thank you.